What steakhouse's demise led to the distribution of animatronic moose heads throughout the Northeast? Keep watching to find out. Beefsteak Charlie's dates all the way back to 1914 when Charles W. Chesser leaned into his nickname Beefsteak Charlie and opened a sports bar that went just as heavy on the horse racing decor as it did on its steak sandwiches. The restaurant became a go-to spot for Manhattanites for years even after it changed owners in the 1930s. Larry Elman eventually bought the chain in the 1970s and began franchising Beefsteak Charlie's into the chain many of us remember today. In 1985, Beefsteak Charlie's 50-plus restaurant locations along the East Coast were acquired by Bombay Palace Restaurants, Inc. By 1987, however, the beloved restaurant chain's restaurant empire was no more than a distant memory. During the acquisition, Bombay Palace Restaurants lost its accounting firm due to a discrepancy over reported renovation costs, which helped hasten the chain's demise. Hilltop Steakhouse opened in Saugus, Massachusetts in 1961 and became a bit of a local icon, at its peak drawing in over 3 million customers per year. The restaurant had a road sign you simply could not miss, with its giant neon cactus looming in the distance. That theme of the Wild West continued after you went inside, with several of the dining rooms named after locations such as Sioux City, Dodge City, and Kansas City. Unfortunately, Hilltop gained some local attention in 2006 when former employees sued, claiming that management had been taking portions of tips from servers. The location eventually closed, partly due to failing sales caused by the negative attention brought on by the lawsuits. Luckily, the cactus remains, though it's so beloved that even the restoration process wasn't without its own minor drama. People called the police on us, thinking that we were taking down the sign, and we had to reassure that, no, the, the cactus is here to stay. Lone Star Steakhouse was publicly owned and had over 250 locations nationwide at one point. In 2006, though, the chain began to show signs of financial struggle, and in order to remain in operation, it needed to go private. According to the Los Angeles Times, the chain was acquired in 2006 for more than $600 million by a private equity firm. Nation's Restaurant News reported that the equity firm was an affiliate of Lone Star Funds, which also ran the successful Del Frisco's Double Eagle Steakhouse. But there were some who were opposed to the merger stating that the price tag did not accurately reflect the company's true value, and the changeover had negative implications for customers. As a result of the change in management, previously purchased gift cards would not be accepted, and the Dundee, Michigan location urged cardholders to file a claim with bankruptcy court. This was followed by the abrupt closure of many Lone Star Steakhouse locations, according to Restaurant Business Online. There is one fun footnote. Though Lone Star Steakhouse is mostly a faded memory in the United States, there's still a location open in Guam if you ever find yourself traveling through the island and craving a steak. If a tasty filet mignon is not enticing enough to drop by your local steakhouse, perhaps a talking animatronic moose head will convince you to take the family out for dinner. Rhode Island-founded steakhouse chain Bugaboo Creek first opened its doors in the 1990s and mainly stuck around the Northeast, offering a family-friendly atmosphere. The chain served up everyone's favorite cuts of steak while keeping customers entertained with a rainforest cafe meets log cabin vibe, including talking mounted moose and bison heads in the main dining rooms and a talking pine tree that greeted guests. The unique environment that the restaurant offered made it a fun place to go out to eat, but even a talking moose could not save Bugaboo Creek from its ultimate demise. After changing owners a few times, the company showed real signs of struggle in 2011 when bankruptcy threatened to close the 13 locations. After a brief revitalization following the Chapter 11 proceedings in 2012, the chain experienced a brief period of decent business. But locations started closing off around 2016, and the chain has since closed its doors for good, auctioning off most of their weird decorations. You need a new moose head for your den? How about a couple of hundred plates for your kitchen cabinet? A local restaurant's stuffed stuff and other stuff is going on the auction block. Around the time of Bugaboo Creek Steakhouse facing bankruptcy, another steakhouse was facing a similar demise. Hi there, welcome to Charlie Brown's. Good to see you. Charlie Brown's Steakhouse first opened in 1966 and grew to dozens of locations over several decades. But in 2010, CB Holding Corp closed 20 Charlie Brown Steakhouse restaurants, which accounted for approximately one-third of the chain's locations. The company said those locations were underperforming, and that decision seemed to help in keeping the remaining Charlie Brown Steakhouses operating for several more years. In 2020, though, the COVID-19 pandemic caused the closure of most of the remaining steakhouses. The state of New Jersey began 2020 with four locations and ended that year with only a single remaining restaurant. In the midst of these closures, the remaining fragments of the company went through a bit of rebranding. There are currently two locations left operating under the new name Charlie Brown's Fresh Grill. 
Mr. Steak first opened in 1962 and quickly became a nationwide success. At one point, there were well over 200 locations across the United States, with television ads aplenty. The chain eventually suffered the same fate as so many other steakhouse chains, dwindling sales and unhappy customers that were not too fond of the menu switching over to more salads and fish. According to Nation's Restaurant News, the first signs of trouble came about in the 1990s, when Mr. Steak faced bankruptcy. The chain was ultimately saved and intent on coming back, but instead sold off its locations, including some to competitor chains. These days, one would have to turn to social media to reminisce about what it was like to dine at a Mr. Steak. There is even a Facebook group devoted solely to former employees of Mr. Steak restaurants, with members sharing their fond and not-so-fond memories of working at the chain. Rustler Steakhouse was opened in 1964 by Joe Campanella, a recently retired football player looking to shift gears and enter the restaurant industry. He operated the chain for several years, selling the chain to Geno's Inc., which then ran Rustler until 1982 when it changed hands again and was sold to Marriott. The chain leaned heavily on a Western theme, with television advertisements featuring cowboys riding in on their mules to grab a bite to eat. In 1984, the chain decided to give its brand a bit of a facelift, swapping out the cowboy aesthetic for something a little more polished. The move was designed to reposition Rustler as an industry leader that could compete with the likes of their major competition at the time. The re-theming was also done in an effort to increase the restaurant's dwindling profits. According to the Washington Post, the downturn in cash flow was due in part to the recession in the 1970s and 1980s, which resulted in the rising cost of feed and therefore the rising cost of beef. While the efforts to breathe new life into Rustler paid off temporarily, the chain ultimately could not keep up with the rising costs and shut down permanently in the 1980s. Steak and Ale opened in 1966 and quickly became one of the first restaurant chains to embrace what would be known as casual dining, per Nation's Restaurant News. Opening around the same time as TGI Fridays, Steak and Ale marketed itself by offering quality ingredients in an approachable, family-friendly environment. The chain prospered, with around 158 locations open in 1991, and around 280 corporate-owned restaurants at its peak. But the 2000s would be the decade when steak and ale faltered, and shortly before the chain closed, it was down to only 62 open locations. But a Chapter 7 bankruptcy abruptly brought the number down to zero, ultimately shutting the chain down for good in 2008. Still, the chain lives on in the hearts of diners. Ten years after the final steak and ale location closed, Bennigan's brought back three steak and ale dishes for a limited time, including its marinated sirloin Kensington Club along with two chicken dishes. The three steak and ale classics are still featured on Bennigan's menu to this day. So while you cannot dine at a steak and ale anymore, the next time you're out of Bennigan's and you want to relive the glory days, keep an eye out for those classic meals on your menu. But remember, nothing lasts forever, not even steak and ale. No matter what they said to try and get you to buy a cheap prime rib. Things that will last for eternity. The pyramids, the Grand Canyon, and Steak and Ale's 895 Prime Rib Special. Another Northeast-based steakhouse chain that exists only in our collective memory is Valley's Steakhouse. Like Beefsteak Charlie's, Valley's had been around for decades before going out of business, clocking in at nearly 70 years in operation. According to the Portland, Maine History Facebook page, the restaurant first appeared back in 1933 as a single cafe with just a few seats. The restaurant's success allowed owner Donald Valley to purchase a larger second location in 1936. It remained a main stronghold until the 1960s when it expanded into Massachusetts. The company was even able to go public on the New York Stock Exchange starting in 1968. At its peak, Valley Steakhouse had locations across New England as well as New York. But when Donald Valley passed away in 1977, the family struggled to keep the business afloat. By 1991, the chain's final locations closed, one of them being located in Hartford, Connecticut. An independently run Valley Steakhouse was able to continue serving customers for another nine years in Portland, Maine before closing permanently in 2000. Although you will find some open locations for this next steakhouse over in Asia, Victoria Station Steakhouse has completely vanished in North America. According to the New York Times, the first Victoria Station Steakhouse location opened in San Francisco, California in 1969 by a trio of Cornell's School of Hotel and Restaurant Administration graduates. 
the train-themed restaurant chain, which was known for utilizing old railroad boxcars as dining areas, went on to find great success in the 1970s, opening nearly 100 locations by 1978. Success would not last much longer, however, as the company then began to experience a string of losses. Victoria Station filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 1986, which resulted in the closure of most of its locations. However, one Victoria Station was able to remain open for nearly 30 more years. According to the Salem News, the remaining Victoria Station restaurant in Salem, Massachusetts was the final U.S. location in operation when it abruptly closed in 2017. The first York Steakhouse opened in Columbus, Ohio in 1966. Growth was steady for the first 10 years thanks to its success in opening locations around shopping malls. But its acquisition by General Mills Restaurant Group in 1976 was when the chain truly took off. After the acquisition, it grew to nearly 180 locations nationwide. While York Steakhouse once thrived off mall foot traffic, it ultimately suffered its demise as the 1980s saw the rise of food courts with more budget-friendly dining options, leaving the steakhouse in the dust. General Mills Restaurant Group sold off the locations in 1989 with only a few independently run locations left in operation. According to York Steakhouse's website, there is one independently run York Steakhouse location left in Columbus, Ohio, where you can relive fond memories of its heyday. But the days of York Steakhouse as a chain establishment are long gone.